that are deep praise worthy. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a word, you know? But, you know, madhmuma bil Arabi, yani, they are radia, you know, bad characters. Dislike. Not dislike, just terrible characters. And it's in the subject of muru'ah. Muru'ah is like manhood or ladyhood, you know, it's chivalry in Islam. And this is a very important subject to me because I feel that this is one of the issues where the dignity of the sheikh. Oh, take a sheikh. Where the dignity of Islam has gone because we do so many things that uh, we call it khawamir al muru'ah, that take away from the dignity and the honor of the, the believer. Does that make sense? So I was trying to think of how can I, you know, address this particular issue with the ummah finding a way that would be acceptable and, you know, using the book muru'ah. And then I, I, I was going to use some of the things from this encyclopedia. And one of the things that I ran into was right at the end, right before it, the last of the characteristics that are praiseworthy, before they get into the deep praiseworthy ones, is wala wal bara. It speaks about, it adds wala wal bara as a characteristic, you know, because, you know, manners are based on your character. You get my point? They're weaker than character. But they're based on. Does that make sense? So this issue of wala wal bara is very, very vital and important. Here, I I made an addendum to this book. When I was when I first wrote this book, I wrote this book uh, a number of years ago. What year does it say in here? It, it should give the year in the first page when 2009. I 2009 on the Kafir calendar. What what year is it on the real calendar? 14. Yeah. Sorry? Muharram 1430. And now it's 1441, right? Mm -hmm. So this book is like 11 years old, okay? And when I did it, I, I think I had just come back to the United States, okay? Um, when, I, when I wrote this, when I put this book together, okay? When I started it and then had it published. Afterwards, I, you know, mixing with the believers, I said, you know what, there's something missing. What's missing? This section that I made, I, I added a few sections to it. And I told you guys at the beginning, I would give you the papers for it when we got to it. Mm -hmm. And that's this section, how'd you tie That's this section here, you pass these out to the ladies. I hope I have enough. These, these, uh, these right here. Pass them to him, pass them forward. Yeah, there's any extras. I get, I get from my wife. No, I don't. <coughs> And the Because I know what you're looking at. Because one of the problems of Talib al is that they're distracted. You know, you tell them one thing and then they start looking at that thing and leaving what they're supposed to be doing wrong. One of the bad characteristics of the Muslim, of the special Tulab al they don't complete anything. Okay? Now, complete the little books before you get to the big books. Okay? Yes, I'm studying an encyclopedia with another sheikh, but that's after years and years. We were, we're studying first grade fifth. Let's get that done and memorized and understood, and then we'll move to other, other, and bigger, and bigger, and bigger. Does that make sense? So when I started to... Oh, uh, yeah, put those here. When I started to mix with the Muslims here in the United States, I said I found out that a lot of people don't even know how to use the toilet. Okay? And that it is necessary for us to point out these things in a classy way, right? Without, you know, you know, um, making it vulgar. And so what we did was we put this poem together. You're on a page that says toilet rules. So after we go, let's go from the beginning of the poem. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. I gave my word with heart and head to praise Allah, send blessings on the Prophet, and as all Muslims must study and pray to fight shaitan, expect mistakes, repent to fight. So the first thing that I have to do now that I'm accountable and my actions call on is look to see what faith demands have I come what do I think about Allah? Why it's correct? The meaning of Shahada is? There is no God. For real, that is? 
The Pope, who he created, he manages the affairs of this from high above the sky. Too high, I say, sublime is he for. And this is what Shahada means, but there are conditions tied to it to which we must adhere. There's knowledge, then yaqeen, and then acceptance, my sweet dear. Then in qiyad, then there's sin, ikhlasu, and Allah, we ask for help and to admit us into Jannah. Then every Muslim must concur. Allah is the messenger. Sent by Allah, therefore we trust. We must obey his orders and he brought the law full and complete. All sacred laws must come from him. And then I have to learn the things I need to do my like regulations of salah and just how much to pay zakat. You know, when I did this with the children, we made them, they move so they could, they could their body talks, you know? <laughs> What part of your body talks the most? No. Your feet. Your feet are the most honest part of your body. They always remember the fight or flight. The face starts lying very early. Right? Smiling at people you don't like. Right? <laughs> Eating food when your parents tell you to eat it and don't cry. <laughs> So, and your hands are expressive, but your feet are really, really honest, okay? So what I, what I want to say, though, is when you're doing this, you know, and then I have to learn the things I need to do my fardu'ains, like regulations of salah, and just how much to pay zakat, the parts of hajj I have to do. Why am I running? Safa wa marwa, right? Tawaf, whatever. You get my point? You put your body into it. The parts of Hajj I have to do is Ramadan and I have the flu. This obligates all Muslimin to a very important rule right here, guys. The fact that you have to do Fardu Ain obligates you to learn the laws and what they mean. And we can all claim that we've done that. But if I name every one, which we have, you know, we start learning. Now, buying is bay in the general sense, but it's contracts and deals that make gen but businessmen tense. No shaddy cat. Do you know all the shaddy cat? Or partnerships that we can use when seeking risk. And when someone won't pay their debt, then Hajj is what we're going to Do you know Hajj? The ideas of borrowed source, well, Lassab is too. Take by force. Do you know what Lassab is? Meaning what the laws of it. I'm asking. So then we haven't done that, right? And that's the second section. Sadly, we've, we've relegated our whole life to just the issues of ibadah. And even then, most people don't know all of those things. Okay? Do you know that it's more from the sunnah to make etikaf outside of Ramadan? Did you know that? And that it doesn't have to be, it could be any time. It doesn't even have to be for a whole day. It could be for an hour. It could be for 30 minutes. So we don't even know those laws. Does that make sense? So we have, let's go over it again. And then I have to, after understanding our Aqidah, right? And then I have to learn, and the only thing we did in Aqidah was a shadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammad rasulullah, right? And then I have to learn the things I need to know to do, my father is. I have to learn the things I need to do, right? I need to learn the things that I need to do. That's the first part of it. Then the other part of it is I need to learn the things I need to do in order to do my fardu ayat. Does everybody follow that? And then I have to learn the things I need to do my like regulations of salah. And just how much to? The parts of hajj I have to do is Ramadan and I too. Right? So that shows all five pillars of Islam. We just covered right there. And I, like I say, this is teaching us minhaj as well. In Aqidah, did we go really far in it? No, no, no. no, we didn't. Okay, you don't, it's like working out one muscle. You don't work out one muscle. You work out the whole body, right? And then you get stronger and stronger. So in the first essence, and remember, this is the first text. We go over Shadu'a la ilaha illallah, just what it means, linguistically, 
And what is what the mafhumat, what we're supposed to understand from it? What are the keys of la ilaha illallah? Then we move on to the second shahada, and we understand what is taken to be understood with that, and then we move on. Does everybody remember that? That goes on to my circle. What we said here, we go around in a circle. We're going to come back to it. We're going to come back to it. And then when we get to outline and fit, we come back to it again, right? And we cover the, the, uh, the ghaybat, right? The four types of ghayb. Then we talk about the ten things before the, the hour. And then we talk about wala wal bara. You see how yet the darraj, by degree and degree, we get thorough and meaningful understanding. And anyone who thinks that memorizing the Qur'an is not learning, who doesn't understand, I should say, that memorizing and reading the Qur'an is not a complete lesson in aqidah, it doesn't understand the deen. On every page of the Qur'an, what are you going to find? The names of Allah. The names of Allah. And an explanation of what it means. And an emphasis, and it's putting in a particular place as a stamp of what just was came before, Right? Then you're going to have the ayah that's going to explain the application of tawheed, right? These are the things that we're going to find consistently inside the Qur'an. And of course, there's going to be stories. Stories about the prophets, right? What's the prophet that, what's the most spoken about prophet in the Qur'an? Musa. After Musa. Isa, after Isa. Ibrahim, right? And then after that, the rest of them, in you know, by the, they come. Some come with a mention, others. Now, the Prophet Muhammad, is he really spoken about in the Quran? Is his life, you know, put in the Quran? Life, no. No, it's life. No. Very, like, a swatch here, a swatch here. Maybe three places you might find some mention of his life in there. So where do we find the life of the Prophet? In the Seerah. In the Seerah. Do you understand what my point is? Why am I mentioning that now? What if I told you from the very beginning about fiqh? That you read about the prophet. That you cannot take fiqh without what? History, seerah. Seerah. And history on top of that. So where does our world history start with? It starts not with the prophet. Our history lessons start with where Allah started. What's the first history lesson Allah gave us? What story? The story of our creation. Adam's story, right? So that's indicative of the first stories we should know with our history, right? The biographies, right? And then we start with Adam. We go through that whole history of, from Adam all the way up to Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the ones that we have mention of. And then the seerah of the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that helps us understand our basic fit along with understanding the Qur'an. And do we stop there? No. Then we go into that time frame of those Khulaf al-Rashidun. Right? Those four righteous khulafa and that time frame of the great ikhtilaf, the great problems that they had. We go through that and then we move on. We move on and we till we get to today. Going through Islamic history in general. In the different areas. Because then that puts a tone on how we're supposed to act today. How the fiqh has evolved based on circumstances that have happened. But in general, when we deal with the fiqh that we're right now, when we're studying the seerah, you have to understand the prophet's life was not helter skelter. Meaning his life, the way it went down, is part of the revelation. Does that make sense? That Allah made everything happen for a particular reason for da'wah to us. And it wasn't the things he was doing just a response to, you know, uh, upcoming circumstances. No. His life and everything that happened is part of our da'wah. Okay? Meaning the da'wah of Allah to us. For us to understand how to apply fiqh. Does that make sense, everybody? Okay. So you have to. Uh, this, these classes don't give me the opportunity like I planned to get into history as much as I would like to. Because, you know, the timing is, this is what it is. Even though it's, it's twice a week. We don't get into it. And you know what I mean? I love history. We can sit here and we start talking about history and it seems like we went off on a tangent because yeah, a lot of times people don't understand how to read the seerah in light of fiqh. But there's an excellent book out there if you have time to read it. It's called Fiqh Seerah. The Fiqh of the Seerah by Sheikh Bufti. Okay? And what he does in it, he 
every chapter, he puts at the end of it lessons in fifth that you can extract from that seal. Does that make sense? Lessons in fifth that you can extract from seal. So I suggest that people, I don't know if it's online or anything like that, but purchase the book and read that book now as you're before Ramadan. And you will get something out of it. It's not a large book. And it's very, I read it in, in Arabic back in the days, and, and then I found that they were selling it in English. And I said, well, let me check out the English version, you know? And I found it to be very good too. You know, it wasn't like there was no take. Sometimes you read books in Arabic and you read them in English and you're like, oh, this is trash, you know? But it, it was very good. Yes, ma'am. Buhti, I think it's B U H T I. Him and Al Badi were like frenemies, you know, they used to always beef back and forth, you know. Uh, but his name is Buhti. But it's called Let, uh, it's Fiqh, Fiqh Sira. I think that's the name of it. I think that's the same th name of it. You should, do you know the book? I don't know if I'll look it up. Okay. Yeah. No, I'm mean, inshallah. You should let us know quickly. Yeah, please. No, he gives up on the sanction. Okay, alhamdulillah. So, what? You, you look at the book of Yeah. Yeah, you send it to me and I'll put it out there and see if you can get what you need to fast. No, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So, and then I have to learn the things I need to do. My father do is like regulations of salah and just how much you pay to carry the parts of hajj. I have to do it's Ramadan. And no, and it's not I have the flu. No, we got to talk a little. And I have the flu. He's being too proper. And I have the flu. And I have the flu. And, and you know, and what would the children do? They say, and I hurt you. You know, because they, they didn't get it that way. So what do you do when that happens, right? This obligates all Muslimin. I've sworn to do Allah's command and not to do one thing haram. And this is indicative that we've broken this rule because we've sworn not to do even one thing haram. So when I fail, I must repent. Before I get a from up above Allah most high before my soul is caused to. What does that mean? What ruling are we pulling out in this line? Right. Tawbah is open to everyone until the time of death. Okay? Until he starts to gargle death. Right? And we went over what tauba is, right? I showed you my drawing of the, the, the metaphysical tauba from one place to another, turning. And then you got to ask permission to get back, right? We understand that, right? And the, so, repentance will not be correct until I'm said. Now, this section is dealing with what are the conditions of tauba, right? What are the conditions? Now, a lot of times we say, well, I know this stuff. Didn't I tell you you know this stuff? When we started the book, didn't I say you know this stuff, Hassan? Yeah. All right, don't you know this stuff? No. So you know this stuff. Now the part about it, some of the stuff you've forgotten. You know why you've forgotten? Because we didn't put it, have a visa for us to memorize it. Okay, that's it. So some stuff say, oh yeah, I, I should have known that. Yeah, you should have, it's not your fault. It's the teacher's fault. It's our obligation to put it and make a visa for the students to remember it. Does that make sense? No. Okay, and so and we, uh, hopefully I'm doing my job. Okay, inshallah. No, I mean, I'll make it easy and give it kubur. So repentance will not be correct until I'm sad and feel regret for what I've done and I intend not to do that sin again. You got to put some emphasis in there. Repentance will not be correct until I'm sad and for what I've done and I intend and if still sinning, I must stop all sinful deeds. And no, it's not allowed to say, maybe one day. For those who think like that will find the devil has. He plans to drop their soul in hell, turn to Allah. Say, I stop for Allah, what I too will be late. A hundred times every day. A stop for the law while two So, you know, you notice we didn't translate that, right? We didn't translate that because this is one of those statements that most Muslims know. And if they don't, we we'll give it to them in the class. But what are we trying to say about saying a stop for the law while two a hundred times in every day? What's the rule? Well, how do we explain that? Find a hundred times a day. Based on your actions throughout the day. 
based on your eyes. Not that you sit down someplace and just say, Astaghfirullah, 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 what you want to Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah. Not that you can't do that, but that's not what's intended. That's not the fit of the istighfar, right? And the tell, right. The, the, the mention of saying Astaghfirullah a hundred times in every day is that you are conscious of your faults, okay? That you are at in real time. That as you're going through the day and you walked into the masjid and you forgot to make the dua for entering into the musalla, you said Astaghfirullah. Once you got through, you said Astaghfirullah. Okay? You were talking to a brother and your mind wandered. You start thinking about something else. So you're not really listening to him. You said, Astaghfirullah. You're conscious throughout the day. And by the end of the day, you might have more than 100. I don't know. <laughs> you don't want to count. You see, but it's always on your tongue. It's fresh. And this helps you do the dhikr of Allah. This is the dhikr of Allah. But again, the eyes work against us. Because what happens is we look at other people and we tell them, Astaghfirullah, meaning you should make a stick for right? <laughs> because we're looking at, so we don't want our eyes to work against us. We have to be conscious of the, the affect of the eyes. As if they look external and then lower our gaze and look at us. Look at ourselves. And reflect on that. Naam, khair. Khair and kathirah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now some people came and said to me, well, what do you say about the hadith where the prophet sat in a sitting and he said 70 times, astaghfirullah wa right? 70 times in the sitting. Well, just imagine if you were sitting in a sitting with other people. What's normally happening when you're having a meeting? People are at odds, right? People are coming up with, with them. So the prophet is sitting there. And he's saying astaghfirullah 70 times just in that sitting based on what's happening in that sitting. Does that make sense? Yes. So when you say say it 100 times, does that mean stop at 100? No. no. You get my point? But strive to find a hundred yourself wrong 100 times a day. Strive to do that. Make that your intention. To be conscious of your personal mistakes a hundred times in every day. And then at the end of the day, if you went the whole day without saying a stuff for the law ten times, now you need to sit there and say a stuff for the law. A stuff for the law. Now, because what you're doing now, don't just do the motion. Think about why. Go through your day again. Didn't the prophet tell us to do that at the end of the day? Replay your day. And put a face on that istighfar. Put an intention there. Innam al amalu or binia. Both of them are correct. Put a face to it. Put an action to it. Because when you do that, you will get more out of it. The next day, you will be better. Does that make sense? Because we want we want quality, not quantity. Allah says in the Quran, ahsana amala. To test you all, to find out which of you all will do the best deeds. Best quality, not most deeds. An empty deed done a lot is less than someone who did an intention deed and did it a little bit. What's the proof? Allah's Messenger said, Khairukum, Khairu Amalukum, Khairu Amalukum, Adwabuha. The best of your deeds are the ones that you do consistently. That you can sustain. We're in qalla, even if it's a small thing. So khayru a'amalikum, your best deeds are the ones that you can sustain. You can consistently do it. And then we have the story of Abdul of, of Abdullah ibn Umar, who said, "I wanted to have a dream." The Prophet sallallahu was always interpreting people's dreams. I wanted him to interpret a dream for me, so I was making dua. I was hoping that I would have a dream so he can interpret it for me. And then one day I had a dream, and I forget exactly what happened in his dream. And he went and he told his sister. Who's his sister? Hafsa. Okay? The wife of the prophet. I had this dream. Tell it to the prophet. And the prophet said, Ni'mah What a beautiful slave Abdullah is. If he would just be consistent and praying at nighttime. So the dream was indicative of his absence of being consistent in praying at nighttime. 
And so he told his sister that because the dream told him that. And he, she told him after that, he said he didn't leave it off doing it no more. You get my point, guys? Consistency is better than, uh, you know, big deal and a little bit. In fact, that's one of the things I learned about marriage. You know, when I, I grew up, I don't have any sisters. You know, so I was in the Marine Corps. So I was in my 20s when I first got married. And I knew I didn't know anything about women. So I went to go study a book. There was this book called Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. Anybody familiar with that book? Yeah. So I said, look, I got, I got to know this. I don't know these things, you know. And one of the things that I remembered from it is that women count differently from men. You know, when men count on how big the deal is. So Hassan is like, don't tell him. <laughs> so let's say a, a guy goes out, and this causes confusion. A guy goes, he spends, he eats roses, he, he gets some candy, or he takes his wife to dinner, and then everything. He says, that I got $300 in my emotional bank account. She said, we had one good night. She gets him one point. Well, he put $300 in the emotional bank account. She put one. Three weeks later, he's still counting that $300. And she's saying, yo, wait, dude, it's been three weeks, we ain't doing nothing. He's like, what you mean we ain't doing nothing? What, three weeks ago, we went to the, we did whatever, you know. And so there's confusion here, okay? And so what the lesson was is that, what I took from it, is that women like to have more of a consistency than this big uh, affair like this every once in a while. And I noticed that the Sharia is like that too. Instead of this one good deed here and then this long interval of, Nothing is better that you do good deeds on a consistent basis, even if they're small deeds. Does that make sense? Okay. Did you guys hear it? Mashallah. <laughs> 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 purple over there. Really. <laughs> okay. Let's get back to the thing. So it says here. Repentance will not be correct until I'm sad and feel regret for what I've done and I intend not to do that. Sin and if still sinning, I must stop all sinful deeds. And no, it's not allowed to say I will repent. Amen. One day for those who think like that, which teaches us not to procrastinate about making a mistake fall. You're not promised tomorrow, right? And remember the story of the men who said they were going to make a stick fall? Anybody remember that story in the Quran? It's the best of the stories ever written. Yusuf's brothers. Yusuf's brothers. Jazakumullah khair. Ahsan al-Qasas. It's called the Ahsan al-Qasas. Why do you think it's called the, the best stories? Because it's the best drama. And if, whoever watched, remember growing up, Days of Our Lives, what's that thing called? General Hospital. Remember those things? What do they call those things? As the soap operas, right. And people were like really into it. When I lived in Japan, back in those days, they used to fly the, the, the movie, the, 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 the soap operas, on the plane the night after every day. So that's how big a deal it was for people to keep watching it, you know, so they could get on point with the watching those things. If now the internet, they don't need to do that. But we're talking about like in the, in, in the 80s, okay? So this story is considered the, a bunch of stories because it's better than any soap opera you could ever see. Because it's not about Yusuf alone. It's also the story of Yaqub, okay? And what here, so it's more the biggest description you got of Yaqub and his life, right? And Yusuf. And it's also the story of the men that were in the prison. And it's also the story about the fitter island that accepted Islam and his father who, who did away with shirk but didn't come to Islam, right? It's also about Nefertiti because she's in there too. You get my point? And it's also about those people who were in prison with him and about the city of, the, the, the whole Muslim in general. How many stories in there? I mean, when you leave the Tefsir, you see how did Yusuf know who was who in all the different cities in order to give them the rights of the food? Well, those guys that were locked up with him, he partied them. Mm -hmm. And they became his mess. Because when you go to prison, where do people come from? All over the country. So he knew the people who knew people everywhere. And they became his first disciples. They lived with him in, in the joint. <laughs> they was tight. Hey, that's like being in the service with a cat. You know him. And they trusted him and they protected him. And they were his runarounds and his main men. And the point is, it's also about the brothers of Yusuf. What did they say from the very beginning? We're going to run this cat out of town. Then we're going to be the best sons our father can. We repent and be salihim. Be righteous. When did they repent? 40 years later. For 40 years, 
They didn't even think to ask for permission to get back in the right position. Because Allah's tawbah, he's the one that allows that. So it's easy to step off. It's, you may not be able to get back in position. You're not guaranteed. This is, again, the arrogance of the human. I'll repent. Oh, really? You know? It's not a guarantee. Don't, don't, don't be so brave. May Allah make us cowards in that regard. Amen. Okay. So, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Repentance will not be correct until I'm sad and filled with regret for what I've done, and I intend not to do that sin again. And if still sinning, I must stop all sin for these right on the spot. And no, it's not halal to say, I will repent. Maybe Maybe one day. For those who think like that will find the devil has possessed his mind. He plans to drop his soul in hell, turn to Allah. He said, Astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayh a hundred times. Every day. Astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayh. Why do we say that's all the Muslim has to say? No, no, that's not why. Again, back to the Quran. The Quran is our dastur. Dastur means our constitution. We always fall back on that. Okay? Thank you, Bani Israel. Every time Allah tells us in the Quran, when we look in the Quran, remember when we, we're going through the tafsir of Surah Al-Baqarah, you get to the point where Allah tells us all these stories about Bani Israel, right? Yeah. One of the stories he tells us, he said, Tubu ila, he said, Faqtulu anfusakum, dhalikum khayrun lakum inda bari'ikum fataba alaykum. When they came to Musa and they said, we want to repent, he said, ask, ask your Lord, tell us how we, what, what should we do to repent? Musa came back and said, Allah says, your Lord says, kill yourselves. Mm -hmm. That's the best thing you can do. <clears throat> in the Rabbikum. In, sorry, in the Bari'ikum. In the face of your creator. Al Bari is the one who detailed you. Okay? Al Khalik, he created you. Musa, would he shaped you? Al Bari, you gave you all the details that distinguishes you from someone else. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Well, someone else. <laughs> Does that make sense? He says, that, and the one who detailed you, it's better you kill yourselves, and then he'll accept your tower. And then we get to the end of Surah Al-Baqarah, where Allah has mercy on us, and he teaches us a dua. The dua is shaykh, Rabbana, la tuzikulubun la la, Rabbana, لا تحمل علينا إسرا جزاك الله خير ربنا لا تحمل علينا إسرا كما حملته على الذين من قبل everybody said she had an aha moment there right well that's what that's talking about yeah that's what that's talking about that's talking about at the end of Surah Al-Baqarah we call it connects to the beginning of Bakr. That's why I told y'all a long time ago that these fools who say, you know, the Kufar say, oh, Bakr is a big sword, it's a bunch of mumble jumble not put together. No, it's all one, one theme. Mm. One theme is all connected. The last eye is connected to every piece of it. That dua at the end where Allah has mercy in us and tells us, look, pray. Say, Rabbana, don't make us carry. That tahmil alayna. Tahmil alayna means make us carry. Okay? Don't put on us. What, we, what you made the people of Bani Israel have to do, okay, for their repentance. <clears throat> Israel, come out, have to who Allah ladina min qabla, like you made happen to those people that came before us. You see how important that dua is now? And he didn't. And he responded to that dua. And he didn't. And what did he tell us that we have to do? Say, astaghfirullah wa atubu a hundred times. Now, if someone's going to chop your head off or say to you, you have to say a stick fart a hundred times every day. Or when you make a sin and you're conscious of it, you have to stand up and pray two raka'ah for a stick fart. Or kill yourselves. You would quickly say, man, it's a dumb, dumb question. Of course I'm going to say a stick for a hundred times and, be, and just sit down for five minutes and ten minutes and think about my sins and ask a lot to forgive them and then pray two extra raka'ah to, to get those sins off. Wouldn't we say that? Well, you already know it though, right? <clears throat> and then shaitan comes and distracts us. And even at night when we ain't going nowhere, we're too busy. Too lazy. Procrastinate. We say, who's going to say, I will repent? Maybe one day, but what are we doing at night? Yeah, I'll do it later. Well, not right now. Well, let me watch another episode. <laughs> right? 
all it, we have to get into real time activities. You know, we, we have to be conscious of our reality. We are not promised to wake up that next morning. And then it's too late. So the one who has taqwa, yaqiba, he's awake, he's awake of it, he's conscious, he's appreciative of that. Okay? Let me get one of these things. So, astaghfirullah wa atubu It's all the Muslim saints. And now we're done. That's our mentality. Now we move to the next section. This next section is called Tahara. What is it called? Tahara. What is it called? Tahara. How much time I, I got over there? Ahmed. I, 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 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Good. That's all we need. Alhamdulillah. Rabbil Alameen. That was our review. You know why we do the review? So that it gets over redundant in our heads over and over and over the same things. Because you have to memorize it. Okay? You have to memorize this text. Not just memorize it and then you got it. No, it's got to be part and parcel. It's a children's rhyme for us. Right? And it becomes part of our, in our mind. It pops up and it helps guide us. So now the next section, this is an addendum to the, the book. It goes this way. As babies, we were, oh, you read it to me. As babies, we were. So to, come on, guys, why is the ladies out doing you cats? Come on. As babies, we were. So toilet rules. Okay, that's the first line. As babies, we were potty trained. So toilet rules shouldn't be strange, right? Right. So just like when we train train our child, fuddle shit. Fuddle, fuddle. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Shadu At babies we were potty trained, so toilet rules should not be strange. Make, make do our and make do our and with left step in. No reading, writing, talking in. Let's stop talking about this. First concept we want to get down is that you know, as, as babies, when we, we take a child, children are wild, uncivilized. I've come to believe this, you know, and it's true. They don't know, you know, they don't they they don't know anything. And we shouldn't assume they do. So we have to teach them everything, okay? And so we teach them how to use the potty. And it's, you know, cute for them. They learn. Now as adults, we still have to use, now what do you do as an adult? So toilet rules are not strange to us, this concept that there is different behavior to be done in the toilet. First of all, the toilet is different from the bathroom, okay? We have to understand that. In the American way, the, the, the Westerners uh, make up the bathroom, there is a toilet, there is a sink, there's usually a mirror, and there's a shower or bath, or both in this regard. Is that fair to say? Mm -hmm. In some places, they'll make the toilet in its own separate a nook, or even just there'll be a, a barrier. In, in other, now these cookie cutter houses, they don't do it that anyway because it's cheaper not to. Is that place authentic for you to 
make wudu and make a ghusl. Yes, it is. Because in the bathroom, the toilet that we're talking about in the time of the Prophet وسلم, and afterwards, it was none of those other functions. And the, there was no hole where it went down. The word of God, it, which we mean now to mean the biraz, the actual feces, it actually came from the place. The place was called the Ghaid. And now it became known as the action and actual the feces. Does that make sense? Yeah. So when we, like in Mauritania, it still was like that. When I was there, you know, you use the bathroom, the toilet. There is no toilet, actually. There is no toilet. You know, it's just you find a place to go, you find a place to go. And then those places that you're not allowed to go, the shade of trees, you know, on the path, those things like that become very realistic to you. And you learn them. Well, as soon as you see someone violent, you say, oh my sister, my Allah, what's wrong with you? Because we have to be here. You get my point? So you, you realize, right, if you grew up in the projects in, in New York, you know, you realize that how foul is, it ain't an ain't a, a, a elevator in the city that you can go into. You know, when somebody has urinated in there and it stinks, you know, in that, in that regard, it's just terrible. So anyway, the, the, the toilet rooms now, the bathrooms that we have now, don't have that. The feces and the urine go out of the place. There's a cover for that particular thing. So the ulama have talked about this and have discussions about this particular, when I say the ulama, the fuqaha, the people of scholarly intellect and understand what the actual issues are, not the people, okay? Because the people talk about these things and don't even understand the sharia at all. They're just talking, okay? But the people who understand what the issues are that are tied to the ruling, that's a different conversation. <coughs> And they have come and said that this, the best one is the one where the room is by itself. But those that have that, cover the toilet up, okay? Now they have some things now that you can put on it. They have, some of them have fur that you can put on it. Or some people can get a, like a little container thing and put up, but you don't even have to do all of that. Just put the toilet seat down and clean the place. If the place is clean when you use the toilet and you make a brief cleanliness of it, then you can use it for those other functions. And if there's space, because some bathrooms are big, then it's even clearer that you can use a place. Even if it wasn't, you have no choice because there is no other place to use. So even on the end of it, they are mujbirun ala dhalik. Does that make sense? You, you, call, you, you have no choice but to use what you have available to. Does everybody follow me? Yes, All right, that being the case, make dua and with left step in. So we have to make a dua before we go inside. Okay? This is why, because the Prophet Sallallahu tells us that if you don't do this, you don't make this dua and ask for Allah's help, the shayateen that live in that bathroom, the jinn that live in that toilet, okay, they will harm you. How will they harm you? I don't know exactly. Okay? One of the things it says is they will humiliate you and laugh at you. And Allah knows best how that hurts you. You don't have to know. Sometimes you tell the child, don't stick your finger in the, in the thing. Do they know why? Do they understand the concept of electricity? But you would hope that they would respect you and not do that, right? Likewise, we should respect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and understand that going inside the toilet without making dua is harmful for yourself. Okay? However harmful it is, Allah knows best. But if you believe in Allah and His Messenger, understand that it's harmful. Make dua and with left step in. So we step into that area with our left foot. No reading, writing, talking in. You don't go in there texting nowadays, talking on the phone, and all this. It's not the Ali ibn Abi Talib, every particular place, this particular type of, of speech and activity. That is not the time for this. We are so rush, rush, rush. I'll call you back. You don't gotta say, oh, I gotta go take a dump. You know what I mean? No, it's not appropriate. It takes away from your manhood, your womanhood, your chivalry, your dignity. I have to take care of a private need. Or I have to go right now. I have to go take care of some personal business. And the person should be, what? What you got to do? That's rude as well. Asking it'll happen. Right? And you don't, forcing you to say, Ooh. that's the nicest thing you could do. Does that make sense? Very much so. So we have, but we have to learn this particular decorum and adab, okay, in this regard. So, because we fall victim to this at times. So, no reading, writing, talking, in, hearing that some people are so addicted to this uh, telephone, they might be in the toilet and then they ring and they pull it out, hold on now, I'm in the bathroom. 
Why, if you gotta say that, just don't answer. Does that make sense? You gotta respond to the text. What happens if it falls in the toilet then? <laughs> no, you should just leave it alone, man. Just don't bother with it. Okay? Just if we can stop for a minute and leave that stuff alone. Yes? If there weren't bathrooms during the time of the Sula, so how did they, when you pray, you know, enter with your left foot and say you The out? area. It's the, it's I told area. you, the, it's the area. Okay. We, we find like in Montana and in, in the desert, we find when someone has to go to the bathroom, they get a, a water and they start walking. So they can find an area that's deserted and not with people. And if you see the person, you might see a lady way over there trying to hide or something. You, 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 every, every, nobody does that. It's not here. You get my point? And sometimes two people will go and somebody will hold up a curtain. You get my point? Yeah, they'll do that. We have milhafas, you know, same suit, Zay Suzani. Yani and Talaf milhaf. I did the ladies rap and stuff like that. And we have this from the Sunnah. You see, the Prophet was taking a bath, and what was Umhani doing? Holding up the cloth right there, right? That's his cousin. Does that mean? And Fatah al Mecca. So, this is what we, so certain places, especially if we're in a Machaim and an Obasi and a tent camp, you know, there's certain areas we go, directions that we go, that we know. And even when you see the people, you mind, you mind your business. I remember the children, he used to say, Ya Abdul Aziz, yeah, I mean, they knew where he's going. He's just te teasing him because <laughs> they see him going, you know, hook. Oh! Yeah, I mean, he'll go far, you know. So that's how they go about it. Does that make sense? Yes. <clears throat> no reading, writing, talking, and squat the way the prophet taught. Then water and the. We're very plain with these things. It's now makes it clear. Squat the way the prophet taught, meaning when you can. That's why we put it that way, because sometimes the prophet stood and let us say you go to, at the end of, of, of you know, the, 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 the town, there's always a junkyard behind it, okay, where people throw their trash. And you see the prophet was there one time and he stood up and urinated. You know, so sometimes <laughs> you might go into some of these uh, toilets and there's nowhere you can squat in those places. You know, I was in Minnesota one year, it was very, very cold trying to get to the, 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 the Islamic Center. And so we're on the highway and there's nothing there, you know? And then there's this little place where truckers go and you're not squatting in that place, okay? Because it's just a nasty place and stuff like that. So you have to do so. Squat the way the prophet taught where you're, it's available for you to do or stand on the thing if you have to, you know, whatever you have to do. Squat the way the prophet taught, then water and the left this sort. So we said this in an ambiguous way so that people could get the hint and to understand what we're supposed to do, okay? Then water and the leftists start re relieved and clean with thanks we pray as we, as we walk away. So people saying this, again, the issue of in fiqh is why we say, you say gufranic before you leave or after you leave? No. That's why we put it in the language. Say gufranic as you walk away. Walk away. So however you want to do it, if you want to do it right when you're walking out of the the Beit al you know, the, the place, for your privacy, or as you're walking out, you say it in there, it's up to you. This is, whenever there's something ambiguous in the, in the Sharia, or it's like, then you, you are ma'dur, then you have an excuse for that. Okay? So, alhamdulillah, and it's not an issue of, uh, uh, it, these will be issues of khilaf, so you say, gufarak as you walk away. Gufarak means your forgiveness. What are we seeking the forgiveness of Allah? The, the consequences of, this is ghafar, right? So we, during this time, we're physically not making dua to Allah's messenger, I'm sorry, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at all, right? We're focused on this, this thing. We might make some mistakes, so we're also always seeking the forgiveness, not the forgiveness, the, the consequences of anything to happen to us, okay? The consequences of the shayateen seeing us possibly or doing anything to us. We're seeking the ghafar of Allah from that. Does that make sense? You guys follow me? While we make that particular dua, Okay, alhamdulillah. And it's from the sunnah not to exceed that. Not to exceed the, the statement of gufran. Okay? Because you find in gufranaka uh, rabbana in the Quran and stuff like that. No, we stick to what Allah says. Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us to say. And that was muhtasaran, muhtasiran. Yani in summary, just gufran. You follow me, guys? No. Anyway, recite the whole thing to me. Bismillah.
Turn the page. On the next page, it tells you the dua that you make before you go in. We have this thing. We, we, I was doing this program for, in Egypt. It was that. Uh, uh, was it? Uh, I stopped doing it when I did this skit. We did a skit where we have uh, Mr. You know, he, he's, he, I forget what his name was. He was like a Mr. Potato Head, but he had a big <laughs> turban on and a, and a feather like that. No. And so he goes, uh oh, better not rush in. Better think about a lock, cause it might be a gin. Say, I will be I seek refuge in Allah from the dirty, nasty gin. And then the bathroom becomes ding. <laughs> and it comes clean. <laughs> so, you know, we did that. So we put that here too. Memorize them for next for Wednesday. Salaam alaikum. Subhanakallah, wa 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 wa